Uh, if you've got a smartphone or a, a, a tablet of any uh, description or a laptop with you, uh, if you can go to govote.at in your web browser, uh, and then we'll be in a, uh, if you enter the code 292096, we're going to actually ask you a couple of questions um, because we want to get your opinion on a number of key issues. So, and we're going to do that right at the beginning. So if you can uh, find a way to that, we should be, oh, we've got a couple of votes already. So, uh, uh, so yeah, so our first question uh, well, actually, let, let me start properly. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is uh, Professor Stephen Curry, and I'm a professor of structural biology here at Imperial College. And this is my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Andrew Steele of the Crick Institute, uh, with whom the college has a developing relationship, shall we say. So Andrew and I are both part of a campaigning organization called Science is Vital. And what we want to ask today is, is science vital for you? So we're going to discuss a little bit about uh, how science gets funded in the UK. It's obviously quite topical, given the events of the yesterday and the day before yesterday. Uh, and so we want to start off, actually, uh, by thinking about how much the UK spends on scientific research. So uh, if you can log in to the, uh, the govote.at site and go to 292096, uh, then you can vote on the answer. How are we doing? This is the opposite of a secret ballot. This is, um, <laughs> yes, this is okay, an electoral so we're not, disaster. Uh, <laughs> we thought it would be more interesting to show the results as they came up. Military research account? Yes. Oh, yes. Big, big deal in the UK. We do like our military. <laughs> so we'll give it another 30 seconds, maybe, just to get, allow people to log in. I'll turn my own phone, actually, to airplane mode so I'm not interfering with the audio. Okay, so I think some uh, peer pressure going on here, perhaps. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. So 30 in a room this size, that's not quite a turnout of 67% uh, or whatever it was <laughs> we managed to do uh, uh, on Thursday. Uh, but I think there's a picture emerging. So let me hand over to Andrew to tell you the real answer. Okay, so what I'm going to do is try and give you a bit of an introduction to how much it is that we spend on science in the UK. And the way I'm going to do that is take you through a project I've been working on called the science -gram, which, as the title says, attempts to make sense of how much we spend on science. What I did was, it sort of started out as a project trying to understand all of government spending, but when you break down government spending to an intelligible level, I found that the figures that were really shocking were the ones that related to scientific research. So we're going to start by looking at an incomprehensibly large number that's often thrown around in the news. The government spends about 695, about 700 billion pounds a year on all of our behalves on various different things. And that number is just so huge it doesn't make any sense to me. So I decided to try and break it down onto a scale that I could understand. And one way to do that is to divide the amount that the government spends by the number of people it spends that money on, the 63 million population of the United Kingdom. And if you do that division, it comes out as about £11,000 per person. Now, suddenly, that number makes an awful lot more sense to me. It's about on the same scale as a salary, or maybe it's similar to your rent. So I can sort of imagine what that amount of money looks like. But what does the government actually spend it on? Well, the big picture categories are actually quite unsurprising. We spend a lot on this thing called social protections. So that's sort of the government's euphemism for pensions and benefits and that kind of thing. Um, we spend a lot on healthcare, education, defence. These, as I say, these big ticket items you probably would have expected. And then I've got this big catch-all other category because there's obviously loads of other smaller things the government spends its uh, money on, things uh, from parks to policing. And where does research fit into all of this? And this is actually the answer to this question, so voting stops now. Um, the government spends about £160 per person per year on public-funded research, which is about 1.5% of total government spending. So congratulations. In fact, this audience is smart enough that you've all got it pretty much right. Um, you're actually quite a pessimistic audience, because even more of you guessed that it was much lower than much higher. Who thought it was 5%? <laughs> I mean, no, that's, the kind nobody. Of thinking, that's the kind of thinking we like to hear. <laughs> So, £160. I'm, I'm actually quite confused by that figure, even now, because although it's brought down per person per year, it's on a sort of scale I can make sense of, 
I simultaneously think that sounds like a lot and a little. It sounds like a little because it is only 1.5% of government spending, as you guys correctly identified. But on the other hand, maybe it's quite a lot because if I got a £160 tax rebate, I could probably buy myself a cool gadget or something. So I'm not really sure how that weighs up in the scheme of things. So as I say, the answer to that question, dead right, good work team. Um, what I want to do is compare this to some American survey that was done where they asked the American public what percentage of federal spending, so spending by the sort of central American government, do you think goes towards NASA, the space agency? The public estimated it was about 20%, so they've got a phenomenally optimistic public. Maybe that's because space rockets are a really high-profile, massive thing that you see on the news every so often, whereas other sort of more obscure government bits of government spending you don't hear much about. The actual budget is a little bit less than 0.5%, so you can see there's this huge public misperception. Now, I don't want to suggest this is purely directed towards science. I think if you ask people what percentage of government spending you think goes on X, Y, and Z, very rapidly they'd spend significantly more than 100% of the government's budget, just because you, know, you sort of think of these things, oh, that must be about 10%. Yeah, maybe that's another 50%. Maybe that's another 80%. And before you know it, you've spent 400% of the government's money. Um, so as you can see, this is a sort of, what, there's, a, there's a widespread misunderstanding about how much the government spends. And I think breaking it down into pounds per person per year and trying to make sense of it is a much, much um, more intelligible way to make sense of these numbers. But to properly make sense of it, to break down that £160 into some numbers that I can actually understand, I want to try and look at some individual categories of science spending. And so first we're going to look at health. And one slightly morbid way to make sense of health is to look at what kills us. So imagine these are 10 average people in the United Kingdom. What are they going to die of? Well, cancer kills about a third of us, and yet we spend less than £5 per person per year on public-funded cancer research. Now, if there's a disease with a 30% chance of killing me, I want to spend more than a fiver a year trying to work out why, and maybe how to stop it. And what's worse is that cancer is by far the best-funded condition. Heart disease kills about 15% of people, and we spend £1.30 per person per year on public-funded heart disease research. Stroke kills 10% of us. We spend 28 pence per person per year researching it. Now, not to be patronising, but this is a picture of 28 pence. That is your entire annual contribution to researching a disease that kills 10% of people. Frankly, it would be slightly insulting to leave that as a tip in a restaurant, let alone as a contribution to this disease, which might even kill the waiter you just insulted. And this is a problem that recurs across science. The amount that we spend on research is dwarfed by the size of the problems that science is trying to solve. So another really expensive thing is energy. We spend about £2,200 per person per year on energy in the UK. So that's if you take everything, petrol, heating, lighting, factory, shops, the works, and divide it by 63 million people. You get about £2,200 each. And yet we spend £10 per person per year, or thereabouts, on energy research. And this is an incredible mismatch. It's less than half percent of energy spending. But also, as well as being expensive, energy is very bad for the environment. We generate a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of other forms of pollution. So we've got this huge sort of human footprint on the Earth, which we could be using that £10 or maybe a little bit more to try and reduce. Now, I'm actually a computational biologist, but I'm a recovering ex-physicist. My PhD is in physics. And so I've got a soft spot for one particular energy generation technology, and that's nuclear fusion. Now, nuclear fusion is a potentially incredible source of energy. It generates no carbon dioxide, even though it's got nuclear in the name, there's no radioactive waste, and we think there's tens of millions of years worth of fuel down here on the surface of the Earth. So it would be an incredible coup for humanity if we could get this technology working and use it to generate our electricity. But the problem is that when you mention fusion to people, they normally say one of three things. Hasn't that been 30 years away for the last 30 years? Hasn't that been 50 years away for the last 50 years? Or hasn't that been 30 years away for the last 50 years? Now, the problem with this cynicism is that it fundamentally misunderstands how scientific progress works. We're not going to find fusion if we don't spend any time or effort looking for it. It's not really a number of years away. It's more a certain investment, perhaps a certain number of nerd hours away from fruition. So the scientists who are working on fusion think it's going to cost us somewhere in the region of £60 billion to go from the experimental reactors we have now to fully functioning nuclear fusion power stations putting electricity on the grid. Now, that does sound like a lot of money. But then, when you think about it, maybe quite a lot of people might be interested in near-infinite clean energy. So we could divide that by, say, the population of the developed world, the 1.1 billion people who live in the high-income countries who are rich enough to be able to afford to pay for this kind of research. And if you do that division, you get £50 each. And I'd put my 50 quid on the table right now. What's even better is we don't have to put our 50 quid on the table right now because we, have got, we need time, we need to scrape together the scientists, we need to build the facilities, we need to do the experiments. So we could even gather together this 50 quid over a number of years. And compared to that £2,200 every year that we spend on energy research, this looks like peanuts. Let's look at some really, really big numbers in science. We've sort of 
got a sense of perspective with that 60 billion pounds. This is the cost of the Large Hadron Collider. 2.6 billion pounds is what it cost us to build this machine, which is where we discovered the Higgs boson back in 2012. For that 2.6 billion, we got a 27 kilometer long tunnel with a particle accelerator in it, which can accelerate protons to 99.999999% the speed of light. And we can smash them together and look for new kinds of particle. To try and think of a comparison for that, let's compare that to Crossrail. For 15 billion pounds, we're going to get 21 kilometers of tunnel in which you can accelerate trains to 0.00001% the speed of light. So you can see that even compared to fairly everyday bits of government infrastructure spending, science looks cheap. Let's go back to that fusion number. We think it's going to cost about 60 billion pounds to develop nuclear fusion. We could compare that, for example, to the 123 billion pounds that Apple made in revenue on the iPhone. And bad news iPhone owners, over half of that was profit. So that means that Apple could single-handedly have developed nuclear fusion using the profits on a single product line. Instead, they developed a big iPhone, a smaller big iPhone, and the latest thing is a bigger small iPhone which comes in a variety of colours. Now, I'm sure you'll agree that's very innovative, but it's not quite nuclear fusion, is it? Actually, on the other side of the coin, maybe it's a good thing they didn't sink their entire R&D budget into developing the iTokamak fusion reactor, because if they had, you'd probably only be able to get the power out of the proprietary expensive cable, and even then, only if you had an iTunes account. So those are some enormous, incomprehensible numbers. Let's bring this back down to the personal st scale where we started. Um, these are some of the pounds per person per year values for research spending that I mentioned earlier in the talk, and let's compare that to some items of personal spending. And since a few of the things we've mentioned are about health, let's look at how much we spend per person per year here in the UK on alcohol. <laughs> 600 pounds per person. And that's literally every man, woman, and child, so you've got to hope that some of them aren't drinking. Now, if I was a space alien, I don't think that we should have um, no, no booze and loads and loads more science. That would be a pretty dull place to live. But if I was a space alien and I touched down on the surface of this planet and I wanted to try and make sense of the strange species I found myself amongst... I might log on to the Office of National Statistics website, and the first thing I'd think is, my God, this species has a lot to learn about web design. But if I did eventually find the document I was looking for, I'd see that these guys spend £600 a year on booze and £5 a year researching a disease that kills a third of them. It just doesn't make sense. Something else that doesn't make sense, weddings. We spend £160 per person per year in the UK getting married. In fact, if you take the cost of the average wedding and divide it by the length of the average marriage, you get over £700 a year, which just dwarfs any of the amounts of money we spend on science. Finally, loo roll. We spend £17 per person per year on toilet paper in the UK. And again, I don't want a world where there's no toilet paper but 10% more science. I do value having a clean bum. But... <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm 100% efficient with my loo roll. I reckon I could maybe save 10% if I really tried. And if I did, I'd have £1.70 a year to play with. I could use that to triple the amount that we spend researching heart disease. I could septuple what I personally contribute toward researching stroke. And I think once this slide starts to look a bit less ridiculous, we'll finally be getting somewhere with science funding. So what we've seen is that science is woefully underfunded compared to the scale of the problems it's trying to solve. What's the government doing about this? Well, this is a fraction of what the government spends on science. It's about half, you can see, because it's about 80 quid, uh, called the science budget. And this is what's happened to it since the coalition took power or in 2010, so it's sort of from 2010 up to this financial year. And as you can see, it's slowly going down. Um, it started off as about £90 per person back in 2010, and now it's about £81. And there are a couple of different factors that have um, contributed towards this. Firstly, because it's per person, there's been a little bit of population growth, and that's pulled it down. Secondly, there's the eroding effect of inflation, which is because this budget has been frozen in cash terms. As your cash gets worth less from year to year, slowly that sucks down the amount of money. Now, you might think, that doesn't make sense. I've heard George Osborne constantly telling us that science is his personal priority, and he's always announcing these sort of windfalls, extra science spending. Well, actually, I've already included those in this graph. That's these little uh, yellow sections I've just stuck on the top there. Because every budget or autumn statement, uh, George Osborne does like to announce a little tiny extra splurge of cash, but often on um, projects that have basically been defined within Whitehall. And so it makes it very, very hard for scientists to plan for this future spending. So I think you can see that there is definitely room for some evidence-based anger when it comes to science funding. We need to tell the government that we want to have this budget increase because it's uh, dwarfed by the scale of the problems that science could help us with. And so I think uh, with that, over to Stephen. Thank you. I'll get the pointer off here, if I may, because we're underfunded scientists, so we're sharing the technology today. <laughs> and by the way, if you do want to see some more graphics like that, uh, do visit scienceagram.org or follow us on Twitter. We're at Scienceagram. So, right. Okay. So, uh, uh, back to me. So, um, I, we talked about all the good things that one could do with funding, and uh, Andrew has shown you 
uh, the sorts of things that we spend money on uh, in total. Um, so I just wanted to explain a little bit about actually the system of how the UK actually government goes about spending uh, money on research. So that uh, is a process, certainly all the research that goes on in universities and research institutes around the country and projects that the UK is involved in in Europe is dispersed through research councils and various other organisations. So um, at the moment, for the current financial year, so before the government dissolved itself, it did actually put in place a plan for the current financial year to take us through to 2016. So there's a current budget of nearly five billion, and then there'll be capital expenditure of about one uh, billion in total. So that's spent uh, this way. Uh, so the blue is the recurrent, and the red is the capital expenditure. So the little bits are spent on the sort of the Royal Society and the uh, Academy of Engineering and whatnot. A little bit on trying to understand science and society. Maybe a little bit more could be uh, spent on that. Uh, arts and economics and social sciences gets a little tranche uh, uh, of funding, but actually here all the lion's share of the budget basically goes to, uh, I guess, what most people would think of as hard science and engineering, uh, and medical research would be included in that as well. So this is the BBSSC, so it's Biology and Biotechnology, Medical Research Council, Natural and Environment uh, Research Council, uh, Physics, Chemistry and Engineering is EPSERC, and STFC is basically large facilities. They help pay our subscription to CERN, and uh, the UK Space Agency, for example, pays our subscription to the European Space Agency, which has done some uh, really wonderful things in the last uh, few years. And then there's a chunk paid out to universities, roughly in proportion to the, uh, the quality of the science that they uh, do. And we've just been through a big exercise to, uh, to research that. So that's, what we're, that's how it's sort of divvied up uh, uh, among the research councils. But how does each research council then go about deciding how it's going to spend the money on your behalf? Uh, although I see some of you aren't yet old enough to be taxpayers, but you will hopefully achieve that happy state sometime soon. Uh, so the BBSSC uh, looks after what's called biology and bi biological sciences and biotechnology. And they, um, like all of the research councils, they have a sort of a mixed portfolio of the things that they want to do. So they do have a number of strategic uh, initiatives and strategic priorities, and those are uh, agreed, I think, in dialogue with government, and that's a reasonable thing for a democratic elected government to do, because obviously there are certain national challenges, shall we say, so such as food security, you know, are we going to be able to feed ourselves in 20, 30 years to come, particularly in view of the fact that, you know, the climate is changing, we're going to have to adjust to that. Uh, industrial biotechnology is something that's uh, really coming to the fore. There's an awful lot of synthetic biology, and around the rest of the festival, I'm sure you'll see some of the projects going on at Imperial uh, in that area. And then bioscience for health, which you might think sort of treads on the toes of the Medical Research Council, and that certainly sometimes confuses people when they're applying for money. Uh, but there is a kind of overlap between uh, sort of direct medical research and then understanding biological problems that may have an impact on health. For example, my research is uh, one of my uh, projects is on human noroviruses, which obviously, uh, unfortunately, many people will have come into contact with. It doesn't kill you, but it's an extremely unpleasant uh, two or three days uh, in the lavatory. So, um, it, so there are um, strategic priorities, but actually, in terms of the way that the money is apportioned, there's what they call strategic applied research. So they will issue calls. They'll say, okay, we want people to work on this. Uh, come, you know, send us your projects and we'll, we'll consider them. And there is what's called actually orientated basic research. So that's not pure basic research. I did look on their website when preparing this slide and they have a line item which says pure basic research, no pounds. Okay, and I think that shows you a little bit about the sort of shift in priorities. And, and that's politically motivated, and that's, you know, that's something that actually we can maybe talk about. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But actually, the orientated means that you can apply for money for basic research, but you probably want to give us a bit of an idea of you know, what benefits will accrue to us uh, down the line uh, if you do that. So scientists uh, like myself and Andrew, we will submit grant applications, and they will be considered by panels of other researchers, and people like us will occasionally take a turn uh, two or three years sort of sitting on those panels and make decisions about uh, all the different grants. And actually, I was a bit cynical about the process before I was on a panel, but I think it's relatively robust. And they just score all the applications, usually on the quality of the science, and then the top, however many, will get funded. Uh, they'll basically work their way down the list till all the money is spent. And at the minute, somewhere between, I don't know, 15, 22% of applications are funded. So there's a very high failure rate. Uh, I know people like to think academics live in an ivory tower and it's all a bed of roses. Uh, believe you me, it is not. 
So um, what happens after next year? We've got the, the money has been divvied up. We know where we're going. We don't really know now what's going to happen beyond 2016, uh, although it's slightly clearer, of course, because the election results are in. Uh, and we're all getting over the, the surprise. Um, I think polling would probably need a, a chunk of money to do research and figure out how to do that properly. Uh, but this, so this was a letter written to the case, the Campaign for Science and Engineering by uh, David Cameron. So a Conservative government will be committed to investing in science and engineering. Uh, and it was that kind of sort of fluffy, yes, it's wonderful sentiment that you saw in the Conservative manifesto as well. There was no actual strict commitment to protecting the ring fence or to protecting uh, science, just to sort of uh, the idea that it was a, a generally a good thing for Britain. Uh, the Institute of Fiscal Studies looked at all the party manifestos uh, in the run-up to the election, and this was their conclusion for the Conservatives. So if they stuck to departmental spending set out for the, this year but implemented no other tax benefit measures, and Cameron has pledged to put in an act of parliament saying he will not raise taxes, uh, this would imply a cut to departmental spending uh, up to 2020 of 8.3% in real terms. So uh, austerity uh, is going to carry on for the next five years, uh, according to what we've been uh, told. Hopefully, it'll be finessed a bit, but we've got to sort of think about uh, uh, what's going to happen. And there are echoes in this of what happened just five years ago uh, when I was much younger, uh, better looking, uh, so the new coalition government got in. Vince Cable was uh, Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills, which had responsibility for the science budget. And he went on the Radio 4 Today program and said that uh, uh, basically sort of 45% of uh, British science wasn't really very good, which was a complete misreading of the government's own statistical and, and, anal and analysis of the quality of British research, of which over 90% was actually of sort of internationally uh, excellent quality. But... There was a, a story being put out that all government departments were going to have to take their share of the cuts because in 2010 the finances were in a wreck uh, and scientists, we were told, were going to have to, to um, play our part. So um, along with Evan Harris, remember Evan Harris? Uh, late lamented uh, MP for Oxfordshire, but um, uh, no, he's not dead, I'm sorry. He's just not the MP anymore, uh, uh, just to, to, to be uh, clear about that. But we wrote to the Guardian to sort of protest this. You know, this was ridiculous. But there was this general dark, grim message coming through that the science budget was going to be under attack. Now, I wrote to the newspaper, but actually a colleague, Jenny Rohn, uh, in, on her blog at Nature, sort of said, actually, uh, uh, enough is enough. It's, you know, the scientists have sort of taken this lying down for far too long. Uh, and it's, it's time to sort of get out and you know, march on the street and, and protest and sort of um, shout from the rooftops uh, what good value for money and how important science is to the economy. And so around that call, just, and that was just a blog post, then coalesced uh, the Science is Vital campaign, which I was a part of uh, um, from the very beginning. Uh, this is a, a completely misleading photograph. It was really a very intense uh, period in our lives because Cable's speech on Radio 4 was on the 8th of September. Uh, the comprehensive spending review was going to be on the 20th of October, just about six weeks later. Uh, but actually, the power of social media these days allows people and scientists and the public uh, to get very organized together. So Evan Harris was very much part of it. It was very good to have him on board because he had... Um, some very high-profile contacts in his address book. So we were able to get some celebrity endorsement. We had a Twitter hashtag and a, an account. We had a Facebook page set up within a couple of days and a website uh, and started accruing uh, signatures on a petition. We started to organize a rally. I've never organized a rally before in my life. It's quite an interesting uh, thing to do, but it, uh, it sure takes up a hell of a lot of time. Uh, but in the end, uh, and this was the night before the rally, we were sort of spraying and making all the placards together. I ruined a perfectly good pair of shoes by covering them in uh, a photo mount. Uh, but on the next day, then, we assembled right outside the Treasury, uh, had a rally of about 2,000, 2,500 people, a lot of scientists, but actually an awful lot of members of the general public who were clearly very supportive of science. And that was one of the great things to learn, I think, from the scientific community, just to sort of get a sense of you know, how much value the uh, general public places uh, in uh, uh, the work that is done in the UK in terms of uh, scientific research. So we had our rally, there was a, a lobby of parliament, and then the petition was presented uh, to 10 Downing Street on about the 16th or the 17th of October, just a few days before. But I remember even at this parliamentary lobby, which was just a week before, feeling that actually it was still pretty grim, and you know, at best it was probably going to be a 10% cut uh, in the budget. 
When it came, it was, we were kind of spared deep cuts. There was this flat cash settlement, and that was, you know, that was good. There were big cuts to the capital budget, which are only now being sort of rectified uh, to a degree. But what was great about it was that it showed uh, how much, actually, with uh, the encouragement of social media, with the tools of social media, one can do. An awful lot of people I spoke to in the run-up to it, asking them for their support, they kind of shrugged and said, you know, well, what's the point, you know? Uh, and these were probably people who had, I guess, you know, 25 years of experience uh, of, you know, working in science in this country. But uh, actually, I think things are changing, and I think, it, it, you know, it really helped to show what you can do if you get together. So... Um, in the run-up to the current election, with Science is Vital had another campaign. The organization is still going. Uh, we did an analysis, and actually Andrew took the lead on this, to show that actually as a percentage of GDP, the flat cash settlement has now eroded the overall UK research spend on publicly funded research down to below 0.5 of GDP. And so that makes us the lowest performer in the G8 uh, uh, group of nations, a set of nations that we would regard probably as our economic equals uh, and peers. And, uh, you know, one can weather this for so long, but clearly there's a direction of travel here uh, that we need to reverse. So what are we going to do about that? The, uh, the shape of the new government is now relatively clear. We have a, a Tory administration. They've got a clear majority. They have been kind of friendly to science. As uh, Andrew said, George Osborne has talked about, you know, making the UK the best place uh, in the world to do research. Uh, but we really have to sort of keep the pressure on them, we think, uh, as the, uh, uh, um, as the uh, government sits down to figure out what its economic plan is going to be for the next few years. One thing we're certain of is that uh, uh, Vince Cable won't be at the helm of it. This is a photograph of him on uh, the early hours of Friday morning. He unfortunately lost his seat in Twickenham, um, so he'll be doing more uh, time with his family uh, because he has less parliamentary and ministerial responsibilities uh, at the moment. But, so, you've got to look, of course, you know, the government is responsible for more than just science, and there are very real and pressing questions and uh, national needs in many other areas outside, of course, the scientific budget. But this is the way that things played out over the period of the last parliament. So, the things that have done well, so DFID is the Department of, for International Development, because the coalition government had a commitment to raise spending to 0.7% of GDP, which is a, a United Nations target, and I'm very pleased to say that they hit it. Health and then pension, work and pensions and education uh, also do relatively well because they are you know, big ticket items when it comes to an election. Uh, intelligence services, there's an interesting debate about uh, snooping and whatnot. Uh, and then pretty much everything else got cut. So, you know, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, uh, transport, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Science was kind of on the cusp, perceived to have done relatively well, and so one has to be careful. And then the picture for the current year is about the same, but of course the, the numbers are a bit less. Uh, intelligence services, I'm a little bit concerned, I have to say, that Theresa May has been reappointed as uh, Home Secretary, but there you go, what can you do? That's a democracy for you. Uh, and, okay, so for the time being, then, the science, that we still have the flat cash settlement. But, obviously, all these other departments will be champing at the bit and going to the Treasury to lobby for their particular cases. And so we have to think about what we're going to do. And the point I want to make is that from, from 2010, we did feel that, as a community, we were able to put pressure. One mustn't think that, you know, now that the election is over and the results are in, that's it. One can still have uh, a voice both as a scientific community and as the broader public, uh, people can get together uh, and they can um, uh, be active and have influence. So there will be a comprehensive spending review. No one knows quite when it is. It might be October, but it might take them to December uh, to sort of figure out exactly what they're going to do. And so certainly Science is Vital and I imagine Case as well will be looking very closely. We will certainly be vigilant at the noises that come out over the summer in speeches made by key ministers. We haven't yet heard who's going to be appointed uh, in charge of biz. And then, of course, but there is this more general question, which uh, was one of the things that we wanted to open up a bit more, which is about, and touches on the issues that uh, Andrew talked about, you know, what should our scientific priorities be? So they were, you know, the government helps to sort of set the agenda a bit in dialogue with the research councils and with the scientific community. But how much, you know, should you, because you're the guys ultimately uh, that pay for all of this, should you be involved in then making decisions um, about science? So we wanted to see if we could capture your view. So if you can, uh, uh, hopefully you're still logged on to go at. And so there's another question that we wanted to ask you. Uh, and that is, even if it brings no immediate benefits... 
scientific research which advances knowledge, should it be funded by the government? Uh, so if you go to, if you, if you arrived a bit late, if you go to this website on your phone or laptop, govote.at, and then enter this code, you should see this question. I think that's pretty good. Should we stop the survey there? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a little more than... Uh, uh, this might be a slightly biased audit. We do realize, you know, you have come to Imperial College uh, uh, on, on one of your days off uh, to something. So, um, okay. All right. Oh. All right. So, uh, some people are not sure. Okay. Well, let, let at least get to 2025. We had 30 before. So. I have a qualified yes in addition to private sector. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So, so, uh, so, th so to, to, to flesh that out, so uh, in terms of what the UK as a whole spends on research and development broadly defined, there's 0.5% of GDP is spent on publicly funded research, so that's taxpayers' money goes in. But, there is, but the overall total is about 1.6%, 1.7%, and a lot of that is brought in by uh, private industry. But there's a very synergistic relationship, I think, between public investment in science, and then that makes the UK, of course, an attractive place for uh, high-tech companies to invest uh, and to come to the UK, which I think is one of the worrying things about the next couple of years is all the uncertainty that will surround the referendum on whether or not we should stay within the EU, which I think an awful lot of the companies that have come to Britain uh, are certainly concerned about. Okay, so, uh, all right, we have quite a friendly audience in that case. And I think it's first past the post, so... Yeah, first past the post. <laughs> <laughs> so just to give you an idea of how that actually oh, yes. compares to uh, the national response, although you're quite a friendly audience, you're not totally unrepresentative. This question was asked by the Wellcome Trust, and 78% of people agreed or strongly agreed with actually the statement, um, even if it brings no economic ben immediate benefits, uh, scientific research should be funded by the government. So this is a widely understood uh, phenomenon, I think. Okay, so we've got a couple more questions for you, so... Hands on those uh, phones and uh, uh, iPads or whatever, um, whether it's a large, big one or a small, <laughs> large one or a white one or whatever. So do you think the public should be involved in decisions about research funding? So should you guys have a say in what gets funded? Now, at the minute, you don't really have a say because it's all delegated down to the research councils, as I explained. So do you trust us? Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. This is looking like the opinion polls before the last election. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think there was such a big yellow po uh, bar <laughs> in that one. It's Clagmania, man. Okay, so, uh, right, so that's quite a split, actually. So uh, about a third say yes, you should. Uh, a third say no, thanks. Uh, obviously happy to delegate it. And then a third is not sure. And uh, Perhaps you're not sure because you don't know how that might pan out, but... So we know we've actually got another question to follow up from that. Oh, yeah. Would you like to be involved? So we've asked, oh, yeah. do you think the public should be involved? Would you personally... So would you personally... ...like to go and sit on a panel or be part of a focus group or be part of some kind of decision-making process that would allow you to influence how we spend money on science in the UK? Ah. So this is interesting. It looks like most people don't think the public should have a say, but they do think they should. <laughs> <laughs> Not the idiot public, but I. <laughs> All right. Okay, we have a very engaged audience here, we I would say. Do, so, yeah. uh, so when this was polled by Wellcome? Yeah, so this is another poll uh, from the Wellcome Trust by, I think it was by Maury, and they found exactly the opposite of what we found here. 74% of people think the general public should be involved in some capacity, but only 31% of people actually want to be the people who are involved themselves. So it's like, I'd love everyone to be involved in the decision-making process, but I've not really got time. I've got a job and like a supermarket to go to and stuff. So this is exa exactly, as I said, completely the opposite of what this audience seems to be thinking. Okay, so uh, I, I think this reflects the Imperial College nature of the audience, shall we say. You're obviously very uh, switched on about science uh, and engineering and medicine. So let's do a little experiment, which is the final question in our series. So uh, here's, here's a funding decision for you. You're allowed to pick one of these topics that, which you would like to get uh, an increase in funding for. So food and mouth disease, solar power technology, Ebola virus, Exploration of Mars, new materials, things like graphene, or um, that was our basic attempt to try and cover chemistry. <laughs> We've got a biologist and a physicist up here. Or two biological physicists, so. it's a bit confusing. <laughs> All right, let's see how that Looks like goes. the buzz about graphene has permeated this audience as well. 
And no, there's, there's one person who cares about foot and mouth disease. Is there a cow somewhere in the audience? <laughs> Okay. So, okay, so uh, chemistry and physics doing well, uh, I would imagine. Solar power technology, uh, well, who knows how that might pan out. Of course, or it could be silicon based, or maybe there are biotech uh, solutions to generating power or fuel from uh, solar technology. Uh, and some of that you'll probably see around the, uh, 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 the, the festival itself. So in terms of uh, research onto sort of infectious diseases, I picked these two out because infectious disease is my thing. And actually, I work on foot and mouth, so thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I will point out a foot and mouth outbreak in 2001 cost this country over £6 billion to clean up. Okay, uh, whereas Ebola virus at the moment obviously have serious problem uh, in Liberia and Sierra Leone and... I got the third Other country escapes me, but the neighboring country in Africa. Obviously, a, a very serious situation, and it has, of course, transmitted then to other parts of the world, but relatively few. I mean, the, the, uh, the number of casualties or the number of people who've died, unfortunately, is around about 10,000, I think, so, uh, so far. But much smaller, of course, than many other diseases that kill uh, uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of people across the world um, every year. So, you know, one of the difficulties with judging you know, how one to spend it is uh, the amount of press coverage and hype that sort of goes into um, particular conditions. So can I ask, who put, up, who put foot and mouth? Why did you put foot and mouth, if you're willing to show yourself? It no? Like an accident, okay. I think. Well, I just wanted to make a new friend, that was all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but, you know... You can see that you know, there are difficult choices to be made here. So who voted for solar power? Who wants to give us a reason why you voted for solar power? So why did you vote for solar power, sir? Okay. So clearly so there are some very it. big direct yep. challenges. To take the completely opposite tack, who wants to go and explore Mars, and why do you want to do that? Cold, Given all the problems dead, we have here on Earth, why should we planet. go and explore Mars? So if you voted for Mars... I think the other important point about basic research, I didn't actually give any statistics about basic research in my talk just now, but it's very, very cheap. So the Rosetta mission, which landed a space probe on the surface of a comet uh, in November last year, cost us about 1.4 billion euros across the contributors to the European Space Agency. And if you divide that up by the population who are actually sort of paying in, the taxpayers who are paying in, it's about 20 euro cents per year. So we don't really know if it's going to give us any particular breakthroughs, but we might as well roll the dice for that tiny, tiny amount of money, I think. But the point about Mars is, is well taken, and I think that's a general point that's important to, uh, to put across to people, is that no one knows where the next discoveries are going to come from. So the Apollo mission, which went to the moon, of course, in the 60s, which was part of the, the Cold War, really, uh, as well as competition between America and, and Russia, did have lots of sort of economic spin-offs. One of the best known is Teflon, uh, I think. So you, you all can cook fried eggs more easily now, thanks to the fact that uh, people went to, to Mars. But actually, personally, I grew up in the 60s. I was completely besotted by the, mo the, the moon. And I do think, actually, you know, we mustn't always boil down the spending on research to a pure economic decision. You know, I think you know, going to the moon was one of the most fantastic things that you know, the humankind did as a species. And it, it, it still gives me a thrill even to sort of look back at the old footage. And I think that you know, it's, it's an important part of our culture as well as being an important part of the, sort of the engine of, uh, of discovery um, for us. Are there things on here that we didn't list that you would like to see uh, prioritized? Neuroscience, yes. So, I mean, Alzheimer's disease is obviously a major uh, uh, problem, uh, particularly now that we're actually, medical research and public health uh, initiatives have done so well that we're now all living longer. Uh, and so more and more of us are then becoming susceptible to neurological disorders. Yes? It, it is, absolutely. 
And if you read uh, this very good book, uh, Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything, which is a great sort of uh, catch-all of science, it's absolutely terrifying uh, on uh, what will happen when a next major meteorite does strike the Earth. Because it certainly happened in the past, and it will happen in the future. And, uh, and, and that is something that could wipe out the whole population. But it's difficult to know how much you're going to spend on that. You know, so uh, I believe we do spend something on it already. So NASA at least does scan the skies. They are actually looking for things uh, at the moment. But at the minute, all they'll be able to tell us is, oh my god, it's coming. Uh, get me Bruce Willis. <laughs> that's, that's about all we can do at the minute. <laughs> I guess, and that right. has, has that raised any questions? We've just got a few minutes left. Does anyone have any questions for me or Stephen? Yes. So, what I, a point that I wanted to raise is the indirect uh, funding going into research because the, you mentioned at the start the pension funds, well, the pensions and the pension funds mainly invest in businesses because investing in businesses is a good way to preserve money, and the best businesses at the moment are increasing their R&D budgets. Uh, well, certainly forward-looking ones. Uh, that's one of the things, actually, that certainly the government sort of struggles to work with. Uh, because I think in Britain, we see that actually public investment in science doesn't always leverage uh, the in private investment that we would like to see. So one of the big disappointments in the last parliament was the fact that Pfizer, which is one of the biggest uh, drug companies in the world, has pulled out of its research park uh, in the UK. It had a gigantic research park in Sandwich in Kent, and that they've uh, relocated elsewhere. We still have many other, and the pharmaceutical industry is very uh, strong in Britain, in fact. GSK uh, is one of the dominant players here. And it is, and that's a difficult territory for the, for the uh, sort of government to work out, you know, what are the best policy instruments, and there's certainly an awful lot of uh, work being done on that, and arguably, you know, perhaps a few more pounds should be sent uh, the way of the uh, Economics and Social Research Council in order to try and figure out uh, those sorts of things. Because when you delve into the evidence and try and make the case for, well, the economic benefit for science, it's actually quite hard to do because it's a very non-linear process. You can't say, well, I put in 20 million here and here's a return of 60 million uh, five years later. That happens sometimes, but of course one of the intrinsic properties of scientific research is that an awful lot of it fails. You know, it goes nowhere. It's a bit like a raffle. You know that you know, there are some winning tickets out there, but you just don't know which is the, which is the winning one. And so uh, that's an important message to get across. And I have to say, you know, the last government, they did seem to sort of take that message on board. There is a, a quite a sophisticated level of debate. Certainly people like David Willits, even George Osborne, I'd say, understand that actually you, you do have to spend money on blue skies research because you cannot predict where, what good things might come out of that. And you have to be able to take that risk. But of course, on a five-year electoral cycle, then uh, you know, politicians like to be able to say, well, we invested this, and here's the results after five years. Unfortunately, an awful lot of scientific and engineering research doesn't work to that time scale. So, so we do need to try and maintain a high level of debate about it. There were a couple of other questions uh, towards the back earlier. Uh, yes, uh, this guy, sorry, this guy here, you had, a, you had a go earlier. You need to have the microphone. I think they want you to have the microphone. Hello. Hi. Yeah, in, in a way, my, my um, point is kind of similar to this gentleman in front of me. Um, I think when you look at the last government um, uh, overspending and bringing us into like £500 billion more debt than we had before they even started, um, looking f for money for science is a, is a difficult thing to justify um, particularly when you look at like the, the amount of like food kitchens we've got and, and food parcels that are having to be handed out, you need to be able to justify it. And I think in a way, science needs to be broken up into short-term, medium-term or long-term projects. And the short-term projects need to be about getting us really, really competitive so that we can justify the science um, you know, to everybody, really. Um, it, you know, solar power, etc., is all very good, but it's all long-term stuff. You know, so that's, that's really my point. 
I think that's probably something that the public sector tends to be le tends to have less requirement to do because if something's got an obvious short-term payoff and you know say five ten years, then the private sector can very easily take out a loan and you know try and do the R and D itself. I think what the public sector should try and do is is do the research the private sector can't afford to do because it's too long-term or it's too high risk. So although by increasing public uh, funding of research, we can try and encourage businesses and encourage the private sector to come and do their research here, a lot of the really obvious short-term stuff is actually done for us by business. And Maybe so, we need to actually ask like, industry, go directly to them, say, what do you need help with? You know? <laughs> Just like, knock on their doors and then uh, sort of help them. I think industry is very good at knocking on the door of government <laughs> uh, as well through the CBI and other lobbying effort. I mean, I, there's obviously an awful lot of dialogue goes on at that, uh, at that stage. And it's significant, I think, that you know, the department that looks after this science, the, bit, the public science research budget is called Business Innovation and Skills. And so it very much has uh, a focus of folding scientific research into the innovation policy. And actually, one of the last things that the last coalition government did was to publish, and this was in December, a science and innovation strategy where they tried to map out a strategy for the next five to ten years. So they have at least committed to spending a billion a year on capital because they recognize that if you've got good universities and good research institutes, actually that's one of the things that attracts uh, inward investment from multinational companies and high-tech companies uh, into, the, into the UK. Mm. But I would like them to sort out their position on the EU uh, very soon because I think that's, you know, that, that's going to put a blight on investment until that decision is in because uh, I don't think any major company is going to make a major investment in the UK until they know whether they have access to that market. And a lot of uh, research could also be you know, joined in with the rest of Europe, of course, as well. You know. oh, it, well, it already is, and uh, yeah. there's, uh, so there's a lot of shared funding that way. Yeah. Uh, one last question here, if we can get the microphone quickly over. We need, we need two people for the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. And then I think we'll have to wrap up. But. Hi. Uh, I hope what I say makes sense. Um, solar power technology, if you were going to categorize it under energy renewables instead of solar power, wouldn't new materials contribute to energy efficiency? I mean, look at graphene and the potential, help me out with this, I don't remember the specifics, but something about helping with battery power, the casings, or I forget what the details were about it, but there's a bit of a two cultures dilemma here in that you know, not enough of the science disciplines know what the other one's talking about. It's become hyper-specialized, and I'm all for short-term investment, but the private sector is more than qualified to take care of it. But the incentive model needs to be there on the part of the government to say there's a bit of a deduction if you actually throw money into this. You know, improve your business, improve your enterprise. So I yeah. guess the thing is, is that is there enough of a dialogue between, let's say, the graphene people and the energy renewables people? Well, I mean, uh, I think you raise an important point. That, that can be a difficult dialogue at the minute because even when graphene was first discovered, it was such a new material that it was uh, looked at very you know, curiously. So the paper by the two Russian guys that worked in Manchester was rejected by Nature. So one of our top scientific journals, they, they, they didn't touch it. So it was published in Science uh, eventually. So even the scientific community sort of struggled to take on board what it really meant. Uh, and, but now it looks like it you know, really has got lots of potential to sort of super material. We don't know how to make it in bulk yet, uh, but uh, the government has certainly sort of followed up on that, so they've spent £50 million in a new graphene research institute, which has just opened in Manchester, partly to keep the Russians working in Britain, and so that we had a, still maintain our reputation as a world-class centre, uh, but also to then help, and I presume there will be sort of incubator uh, companies there. But we've got to, and as a scientific community, I mean, I take your point, we've got to make the case that you've got to spend money on the blue sky stuff, because actually if you look back over the 20th century, when we've done that, lots of really good things have, have, have come off it. And actually there's a big exercise that's just gone through, it's called the REF, don't need to know the details, but basically every single university department was asked to show, okay, uh, for the last five years, the research you did, how did that impact? What new products or companies or policies or decision-making, how did that help the rest of society beyond just got you a couple of nice papers in a, in a good journal? And so there's a huge uh, resource there that I think certainly as advocates for science that we can draw upon. And, you know, we've got to be sort of pushing those stories up and having this conversation with the public because at the end of the day, you know, we live in a democracy. Whether or not you liked the result of the election yesterday, uh, that's the rules of the game that we play. And we all, I hope, just accept that that's, you know, that's the way we do things. Uh, and we accept decisions based on the, a plebiscite 
And, uh, well, hopefully, as we uh, go into the next five years, we can have a much more enriched and energetic and uh, proactive uh, uh, discussion about science, both with the public and with, uh, with the public and, and uh, between the public and government. So let's keep telling them what we think. So with I'd that... I'd just like to add one... Um, so the guy, Andre Geim, who's one of the Russian guys who discovered graphene, is actually a brilliant advocate in, in the sense for basic research. Graphene, he described as one of his Friday experiments. He had done sort of 10 or 15 over a period of a couple of decades where he just had a crazy idea and seen if it worked. And I think the, the first way that you actually manufactured graphene, graphene is this single layer of carbon. You got some extremely high purity graphite, which is the stuff you find in your pencil, placed a piece of sellotape over the top and ripped it off in the hope of dislodging just a single atomic layer. So it's this incredibly simple technique. Um, which, as I say, was just sort of tried by him one Friday. Now, Andre Geim is, one of the, is in fact the only person who has the rare distinction of holding both a Nobel Prize, which is for his discovery of graphene, and an Ig Nobel Prize, which is actually for another of his Friday experiments. The Ig Nobels are awarded for sort of uh, surprising or maybe ridiculous scientific research. And what this Ig Nobel was for was for levitating a frog in an extremely strong magnetic field. It's, an, it's a brilliant video, well worth looking up on YouTube. Um, <laughs> And he did cheat slightly because frogs look basically the same whatever size they are. He actually did it with a very small frog. But nonetheless, you can see that the, the sort of things this guy was doing actually sound quite wacky. And if you'd said, you know, if he hadn't won this Nobel Prize and I said that his two big experiments were levitating a frog and putting some sellotape on, on a pencil, then you'd perhaps think he was a nutcase. But it just so turns out that one of them is a sort of Nobel Prize winning and potentially technology transforming discovery. And the other one's just a brilliant YouTube video. All right, so with that, I think we'll wrap up, and thank you very much for coming along today, and let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you.